Okay, hello everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Ryan Woodward and I'm the Chief of Legislative and Regulatory Affairs here at the uh, National Volunteer Fire Council. Uh, today we brought together a uh, roundtable of uh, some very knowledgeable and uh, distinguished panelists uh, to discuss um, a topic that I, I know is a large concern to uh, small fire, fire departments uh, throughout the country. Um, the uh, upcoming, um, uh, well, the uh, current uh, proposed uh, rule that is out right now uh, that was put out by OSHA to uh, re to update the uh, their emergency response standard. Um, this is the first major update that they will be conducting of this standard since it was uh, since it came out in 1980. Um, the uh, this uh, updated uh, language was. Uh, was published in the Federal Register on February 5th, and that triggered a 90-day comment period, including on May 6th, uh, to uh, for all of us to provide feedback uh, on this proposed standard. Uh, as we're going to discuss today, this has a, a, lot, a large impact um, on the fire service, and uh, particularly on small departments, and uh, we encourage all of you to, uh, to submit comments to specifically net, let OSHA know um, how how this uh, uh, proposed rule will be burdensome to your department and, you know, what you like and what you don't like. Um, and what we're also going to discuss here today is, uh, you know, I've heard from, from a lot of volunteer departments across the country that they are upset about this. But the thing that we need to convey to OSHA is we need to convey a lot of specifics. We need to convey a lot of data when we're when we are submitting comments to them. So, uh, so of course, again, our panelists will help you kind of navigate through that and we'll kind of go over some specific as to what you can do to a what you can look at within this proposed language and b what you can do to really make your comments effective and to convey what this will do to your department and uh, what we'll do quickly is i will share a screen just to kind of um go over um what uh what states throughout the country uh will be specifically affected by this um i mean of course kind of uh with who will be impacted by this rule is you know kind of subject to, there is some ambiguity there but what we do know is from, from the volunteer perspective that uh volunteer departments that were within osha states that are considered state plan states and there's 29 of them those are the folks who should really focus on this Additionally, if you're a nonprofit department that falls outside of an OSHA state, this is this too is something that you could focus on. And I'm sure our panelists will go on go in depth a little bit further on this. What I'll do is uh, just very quickly before I introduce our panelists, put up a, uh, a just a map for you all to get an idea as to uh, what a, uh, a an OSHA state plan state may be and if this may affect. You. Um, so just put this up here if uh, we all can see that. Panelists, we can see that, right? Um, and uh, so that's just kind of to give you all an idea. So you can see uh, just kind of briefly as we're as we're having these discussions, what a uh, OSHA state plan state may be. And um, and then so uh, so what I'll do is uh, I will introduce uh, each of our panelists. They'll kind of uh, give a synopsis of uh, how they see this uh, this proposed regulation, um, and then we can uh, go in and uh, answer your questions. Uh, so first, uh, first off, we uh, we have uh, Bruce Lundgren, who's the Assistant Chief Counsel at the Office of Advocacy for the Small Business Administration. We also have uh, uh, Chief Joe Maruca, who is our uh, own director from Massachusetts here at the MVFC, and also uh, Chief for the uh, West Barnstable uh, Fire Department. And then we have uh, Dave Denniston, who is the second vice president of the Association of Fire Districts for New York. Uh, of course, New York is one of those states that is a state plan state for OSHA and volunteers are considered employees for that state. So um, again, I will uh, I'll first turn it over to Bruce and then we could uh, go to Dave and Joe and we can answer all your questions from there. So thank you all. Okay, thank you, Ryan, and good afternoon. My name is Bruce Lundegren, and I work at the Office of Advocacy at the U.S. Small Business Administration. I'm going to limit my comments to administrative law and uh, issues like that and leave it to Dave and Joe to discuss operational fire department issues because I don't know very much about them. The SBA Office of Advocacy, where I work, is an independent federal agency created by Congress to represent present the views of small entities before federal agencies, Congress, and the White House. So we are, by statute, uh, represent the small entities that would be regulated by this rule. The Office of Advocacy oversees federal agency compliance with the Regulatory Flexibility Act, a law that requires federal agencies to assess the impact of their regulatory proposals 
on small entities and consider less burdensome alternatives that achieve their objectives while minimizing costs to smalls. Small entities include small for-profit businesses, small not-profit organizations, and small governmental jurisdictions with a population less than 50,000, such as small cities, counties, towns, districts, and the like. All three types of small entities would be impacted by this possible OSHA rule. In addition, several federal agencies, including OSHA, are required to convene what's called a Small Business Advocacy Review Panel, also known as a SABRIFA panel, before they can propose a rule that will significantly impact small entities. OSHA convened such a panel for this emergency response rule in 2021. And the panel issued a final report to OSHA on December 5th, 2021. I was a member of the panel and we were assisted by about 35 small entity representatives who reviewed the background materials and provided their advice and recommendations to the panel. The small entities included public fire and rescue, town managers, private company fire brigades, ambulance services, and other responders. The biggest issue for the small entities included providing maximum flexibility for smalls, not imposing unachievable costs, and recognizing the technical limitations and differences between large and small entities. There was also a great deal of concern about the impact on volunteer and other small career and combination fire departments. Dave Denniston was one of the small entity representatives on that panel, so he can add uh, to this if he wants to. The final report of the panel is available on OSHA's website and in the rulemaking docket. I wanna make a couple of points about OSHA's legal standard and how to file effective public comments. First, the Administrative Procedure Act and the Occupational Safety and Health Act require OSHA to publish its proposed rules for public comment and base any final standard on substantial evidence in the record. That means that OSHA must weigh and evaluate all of the comments and information it receives from the public and base its decision on a reasoned determination. So OSHA needs really good comments and data from the regulated community on how much time, expense, and other costs this rule would impose, and what are the biggest challenges to complying. Second, OSHA's statutory authority delegated from Congress requires OSHA to identify a significant risk to employee safety and health and that any final rule it adopts must mitigate that risk and be technically and economically feasible. These are legal terms of art that OSHA must follow, so the agency does not have authority to regulate risks that are not significant or technically and economically infeasible. Finally, a reviewing court would overturn any final rule by OSHA if it is arbitrary or capricious, which is a difficult legal standard um, because a lot of deference is given to the agencies. But in closing, the most effective comments you can provide will be based on sound data and analysis, will describe your current operations and any challenges to compliance the rule would, would impose, and will um, not be in any, any aspects of the rule that are not technically and economically feasible. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Dave and Joe and let them talk about the more ap operational aspects of the proposal. And, Thanks, Bruce. And if I may, too, Dave, I mean, also like, because that's kind of a great transition. So, you know, we're, we're talking about these terms of uh, just, you know, economically technologically feasible uh you know we're talking about you know is there is there a significant risk and you know this is pr particularly you know interesting we were looking at small departments uh you know dave i know you've kind of conveyed uh, some great things in in previous webinars and conversations that we've had where you know kind of like specific aspects to look at here um and also what do what does that term economically and technologically feasible look like uh, how, as you, uh, with operating within a fire department, convey that in your comments, and um, you know, how do you how do you determine if there's significant risk? And also, what is the data that OSHA really needs to see in these comments to kind of emphasize the points that Bruce made to really uh, make a strong case with them? So uh, that's just something I'll also add in before we turn it over to Dave, which because I know Dave, I've heard you make some great comments on these exact topics. So, yeah. 
Beautiful. Thanks for being here. And um, Bruce, thanks for leading us off and kind of peeling this thing back a little bit, because I think that's one of the, the biggest concerns we've got at this point. And so a lot of the things that we're hearing is, where did this thing come from? It came out of nowhere. Who's behind this? You know, what's what's the drive and all of those kind of thing. And I think, you know, we've been pretty clear with our message all along that, you know, we're not opposed in any way, shape or form to anything that's going to help with firefighter safety. And I think as a country, we need to look at this and say, we probably are behind the times. And there's a lot of things that we should and could be doing as a collective fire service to make the job a lot safer for all of our folks. I mean, we look at the line of duty death numbers, we, we see some of the statistics and the stories and all those things that are out there. And I think we've all got to admit and recognize there are some great things in here and some things that we could and should be doing. Um, you know, when we look at this as well, I think it's important to understand that, you know, OSHA is not the enemy. And I've heard that a lot of times and how this is OSHA versus us and everything else. No, OSHA is trying to do what probably we should have been doing for a number of years in setting some standards and making things safer for everybody. So, you know, it's easy to get emotional on this topic when you start looking at it and you start peeling it back. I think it could have major impacts on how fire service is delivered in the United States. Um, you know, you look at what we've done historically and you look at some of the things, you know, OSHA started on this back after, you know, September 11th, when Congress, you know, mandated to them that they take a look at the national response to terrorist events, two major incidents and those kind of things. And that's when OSHA started putting things together in a standard, you know, that's been around since the 80s and, you know, has probably needed to been updated for quite a while since then. So it, it didn't come out of nowhere. It's not, you know, somebody trying to drive this and, and push us into a corner and those type of things. But we also think, you know, while we mentioned those things, that we take a look at What's this going to mean for my fire department? What's this going to mean in my locality? And, you know, Brian, you did a great job starting us off with what does this mean for individual states? Because it's different for all of us, depending on how we're set up, whether we're considered employees, whether we're considered volunteers in our states and what that looks like, whether your state is an OSHA approved state or OSHA specific state. All of those type of things kind of weigh into this, and we've got to digest all of that as we're we're looking at it going forward. So I was, uh, as Bruce mentioned, I, I sat in on the small business administrative work that had been done for a couple of years prior to this. We uh, had a number of hearings, sat through a lot of testimony and what I thought was some very compelling thoughts and ideas on how this could be devastating to the fire service or different parts of it. Uh, I really thought at that point in time that OSHA was going to take all that information, digest it, and come out with something. It was back around December 23rd, right around Christmas time. I got an email um, from a good friend, Joe Maruka, who said, have you guys seen this thing is now published on OSHA's site? And I'm like, wow, where, where did that come from all of a sudden? And Joe did a great job, you know, breaking down what it meant. And even though I had worked on it for a couple of years and come up with some of the response to it, I don't know that I had totally digested what it means. And I think that's one of the places we're in. One of the things we really want people to get out of the webinar today is you need to look at this document. You need to go in and understand what's it going to mean for my organization. You know, we tell people all of the time, one of the things that I've proposed is it's 608 pages long. Probably most people are not going to sit there and go through that like Joe did so eloquently for us and broke it all down. But the bulk of the information is in 60 pages of the actual standard. You need to take that 60 pages and go through it. And I've recommended to people go through with four highlighters. So use the first color of a highlighter to look at the things that are in the proposed standard and say, what are these things that we're already doing? Great idea. My fire department, my organization, we're already doing this. We're ahead of the curve. Then take the second color and start highlighting the things that's in the proposed standard that you're not currently doing, but you probably could do with very little lift. It wouldn't take a lot of money. It wouldn't take a lot of time. But these are the things that we could do that, you know what, we should be doing and would make our fire department a safer place for everybody to be. Take the third color and, and highlight those things that are in the proposal that say, hey, here's some things that we probably could and should be doing, but it's going to have some major impact for us, either technically or economically. It's going to cost us a lot of money. We're going to need additional manpower. We're going to need additional administrative staff. Yeah, we could do this, 
but it's, you know, it's going to be a big lift for my organization. And then the fourth color things that you just don't think are possible at all. You know, I don't see how my fire department could ever do this or get this to that level. You know, I've done that uh, seven times now. I think I've started from scratch and gone through it. And some of the colors have changed on some of the individual items as I've done that. But what I found is there's not a lot of things in here that I, I truly object to. There's not a lot of things in here that I say this is awful or this is terrible or there's no way that this would ever work. There's a lot of that. Yeah, we could do this or we're already doing it. And then, you know, the bulk of my stuff comes into we could do that, but there's going to be some major financial impacts to my organization if we did that. So I think if people dive into this, if they take anything away from the webinar today, dive into that project. And as Bruce mentioned, it's easy to get emotional about this. It's easy to go, well, you know, this is just an unfunded mandate. This is just, you know, somebody else trying to do us how to do our job. This is this organization versus my organization and those type of things. And, you know, I don't think those comments are really going to help us. I think what we need to do is dive deep and be able to sp point out specific items in there that for this reason or that reason, we have trouble with. The other point that I think is very important as we dive into this to understand is the, the meat and potatoes of this standard is about 60 pages, but it also incorporates a number of NFPA standards by reference. It's called IBR, incorporated by reference. And that what that means is any place in that, I, in that NFPA standard where you see the word shall or you see the word must, that now becomes part of this standard if the thing passes it as it is today. So not only would you be responsible for the things that they spell out and tell us, but you'll also be responsible for all of those NFPA standards. And again, you know, my fire department for years has tried to do everything we could to help meet the NFPA standards, but there's certain pieces of them that just aren't economically or technically feasible for my organization. So I think those are the things that as we get into this, we got to look at and say, it's not just this document, but it's all these incorporated by reference documents that now we would be responsible for. And just to understand and digest what those are is thousands of hours worth of work. And I think, you know, that's that's one of the things that we need. And that's something that I pulled out of the, the stuff that Joe had put together when he started talking about these incorporated by reference. I'm like, what does that mean? And what's that look like? And the deeper I got into that, the more concerned I was with how this thing currently stands. Am I up? You, it's all up to you, Joe. Thanks a lot. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pound you home on like kind of three points I, I really want to make a point on. One is that this, this um, regulation, if it's approved, is exhaustive, bo both in terms of the volume of what you're going to have to do and exhausting in terms of the effort that you will have to put into to meet this thing. I, I have up on my screen all of these NFPA standards that are incorporated by reference. There's about 30 of them. And so each time they incorporate, you know, NFPA 1001 uh, into this, uh, it means that the entirety of that NFPA document is now part of the regulation and will become part of law. And it's important to understand that as soon as they do that, the nature of the NFPA standard changes from a, a standard or, or an industry best practice to a legal requirement. And that's a huge difference. It doesn't give you the flexibility that we currently have in, in interpreting the standards, in making the standards fit into our communities or into our budgets or into our operations. Um, I think we can all look at these standards and say they're great, but there's elements in almost every one of these that doesn't fit my department or my community. I'm, I'm in a town of 3,000 people. Um, you know, we, we don't have tremendous resources relative to the urban fire, an urban fire department. We don't have a planning department. We, we don't have our own legal department. We don't have a GIS department. We don't have an analysis staff. Uh, we wear all of those hats while we're trying to fight fires and run our budgets. Um, but the other thing you need to understand, when they incorporate this by reference, they're freezing it in time. So they're going to incorporate by reference NFPA 1001. That's the standard for, um, you know, firefighter training. And they specify the 2019 edition. 
So if NFPA changes the standard in three or four or five years, we're still stuck with the 2019 edition in law, unless OSHA decides to amend its regulations. And, and that's critical because right now, under the NFPA system, we can exert influence and pressure and we can convince the technical committee that it's time to change the standard and, and go in a different direction or to remove something from the standard that doesn't work for us. The NFPA process is flexible in that regard. Once this is locked into law, it doesn't matter what we change at NFPA. We're still stuck with what it said in 2019. And when you incorporate these things into federal or state laws, they tend to stay around for long past, you know, their, their freshness date. And, and that's something you've you got to be on top of and understand. Second thing I, I want to kind of pound home at you is it's critical that every one of you, and I think there's 1,100 people out there right now, every one of you needs to file a comment. You need to make comments. You need to hit that link and make a comment. And you need to tell OSHA why this isn't going to work for you and your fire department. And, and this is important. Don't try to do this globally. It's too massive. <laughs> I, I can barely write something global on this. And, and Ryan, and we're, we're working hard to do it. But make it very specific. Pick out two or three critical areas in this specific to you and your fire department and explain to them why this won't work for your community. You know, um, the, the, the type of event occurs once every 14 years and it's crazy for you to have to do this kind of training or have this kind of equipment. You don't have the resources in your world to be prepared to the level of this standard for something that only occurs once every 14 years. Um, you know, make it, bring it down to that micro level. Uh, OSHA needs to know that you don't have a planning staff or an analysis person or a GIS department to, to work on this for you. OSHA needs to know what your budget is. When you tell them your budget is $68,000 a year or $680,000 a year, these are tiny amounts of money. They think everybody has twenty, thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000 to spend every year on compliance with this stuff. And we don't. Almost none of us do. Half the fire departments in this country are in town smaller than 3,000 people. We're not doing it. The third thing is attack their data, their risk, their assumptions. Um, a lot of this is built on, on the assumption that we in the fire service have not taken adequate steps to keep our firefighters safe. And they focus on, on cancer and mental health and suicide and cardiac events. And while there is some data on the cardiac side, I think we got to kind of separate that out a little bit. There is not a lot of good data regarding the volunteer fire service. And, and let me rephrase that. There's not a lot of good data regarding small fire departments, fire departments that are doing 100 calls a year or 200 calls a year. My, my department, we did three building fires last year out of 600 incidents or, or so. You know, it's mostly EMS in our world and bells and smells and things like that. Um, we're not engaging in enough risk to warrant all of this, but they don't understand that. Nobody's really explained this to them, that there's very little data that indicates that in small towns, cancer among firefighters is, is a critical problem that OSHA needs to get involved in. Um, you know, they don't have any real solid data on, uh, you know, mental health and uh, suicide issues in the very small fire departments. It's not to say these things do not occur. It's not, you know, I mean, 60 miles up the road from me is the city of Boston, which has a horrendous cancer problem. I mean, it's there. There is no doubt about it. They have the data to support it. It's a serious issue that needs to be dealt with. Uh, but you come down the road 60 miles to me, 
And it's a tougher case. Um, in, in 20 years, we've had one firefighter who's, who's had a, a, a cancer dur during their time here. Uh, we, we don't, we haven't had a suicide in all of those years um, that I've been chief of department. And so I know that the risk is different and we need to talk about risk benefit and, um, you know, and the cost benefit of these rules in very small communities that are in low risk operations. Uh, and it is important that they understand how few resources you have. Be very specific about that. So that's kind of that's my initial rant. I don't want to take up everybody's time, but I mean, I think those are kind of the the three big points for me at this point. Thanks. No, thank you, everybody. And uh, no, I mean, and this is I think Joe hit the nail on the head. Where you know, I mean, a we definitely encourage, and all the panelists, frankly, have. But I mean, Joe is anchor. Uh, you know. A, it's very important for everybody who's on this call to uh, to submit uh, comments to OSHA on this. They really do need to hear that their assumptions that we have, that you all have the time, you all have the budget to cope with this is is flawed. I mean, even in their own economic analysis within this uh, proposed reg, I mean, they're, you know, they, the, the benchmark they like to use for economic feasibility is 1% of revenue per regulation. Their calculations for volunteer departments have have put it around put this around four point nine nine percent of of the budget of the average budget for uh, volunteer departments, um, and then they kind of include in there well it's 0.16 percent for the municipalities, and uh, you know they should be able to backfill. Well, that one one point right there tells me a lot that they're operating on a lot of uh, misunderstanding and false assumptions, because I mean. First of all, average departments. We all know that, you know, probably median data would be a be much better benchmark because you have some very, very well-funded volunteer departments out there and you have a very, very large number, a far, large, far greater number that are dealing with tremendously small budgets. So median data probably would be the better read on this. So that's point one is probably why they're vastly underestimating the economic impact of this. Two, how many departments out there self-fund and don't have access to that municipal funding to uh, to backfill there? And three, how many municipalities, Joe? How would you? How do you think West Barnstable Town will go go to uh, town board would feel if you went to them and said, "Hey, we have this huge reg. You guys have plenty of money that's not allocated anywhere else to you know help us." Exactly. That's what they're going to yeah, do. Uh, you know, so so it's you know can, this is the information that OSHA needs to understand that they are, and this is just one point that they are operating under under an assumption that we all can absorb this a lot better than we can. I mean, I think I'm I'm trying to recall. I think in our previous conversations, I was actually just trying to double check myself in the data, but they're estimating, I think, an average of $4,800 dollars and 173 hours. Well, who has $4,800 dollars and 173 hours on this call? I'm seeing a number of folks of the thousand people we have this call in departments, you know, commenting, I have a $6,300 budget. I have a $4,500 budget. Uh, you know, it's just the, the funds aren't there. And that's what OSHA needs to hear, those that specific data. So when you when you make that comment to OSHA, don't just say that this is going to be burdensome and I can't do it. Go into specifics. And I think Dave Dennison raised a great point. Go through the last portion of this language. Um, it's around in, in the there's a 608 page version of the document, and then since it's been published in the Federal Register, there's a 250 page version of the document. Um, and that's the one that's published in the Federal Register. The very end of that document, 40 pages in the 608 page version, around 10 to 20 pages in the 250 page version in the Federal Register. That's where the meat and potatoes is of this um, uh, of this proposed rule. And that's when and uh, Dave's 100 percent correct. Go through it, figure out, you know, what's feasible, what's not feasible. And the stuff that you're just looking at that saying this is not feasible. That's where OSHA needs to hear from you. Um, and Ryan, as you, as you talk about that, you know, yeah. a couple of things jumped out to me, too. I looked at the 173 hours. I can tell you I have hundreds, if not thousands of hours trying to digest this thing at this point. I still don't think I have a great handle on it. 
So I'm like, where where does my local fire chief have the time to read this thing, digest it? That doesn't even start to touch the 173 hours that they're talking about administrative functions for it. And again, they bring up that figure of about $4,800 to do the math. That's about $27 an hour. I don't know that we can hire somebody with the expertise needed to digest this thing for $27 an hour. And some of the data that they used as they put this together goes back to 2002. Well, I know what my labor costs were in 2002, and they're nowhere close to what they are today. So those numbers never got updated as this thing worked its way through the process. So I think there is some flawed numbers in what's what we're looking at there. As you're talking about that 40 pages or 60 pages or whatever the meat and potatoes of this thing is, again, I keep going back to the included by reference NFPA standards. And it's not the standard in its entirety, okay? So we need to be clear about that. But anywhere where it says shall or must, those are now the things that become incorporated into this law. So we, I had somebody you know, on my staff go through the standards and start pulling out the shells and must. There are over 1,500 shells and must in those incorporated by reference. So it's, it's not minor, it's substantial of what that would mean for your organization. So, you know, again, the data and I I wish people could see our chat flow here and our question and answer flow because it looks like a ticker tape parade. It's just it's rolling so fast you can't even look at it. it And a lot of emotions flying and those kind of things. And, you know, we, we get that and we understand that as well. But, you know, I think what's really important in the message is we need everybody that's this passionate about this to get a comment in. And the first thing we're trying to do is a 90 day extension. Give us 90 day more days to digest this, to understand this, and then to, you know, to tell you what this means for my organization. And then on top of that, you know, I think we all need to ask for that 90 days, but then we need to get people to start putting together. And, and you know, the suggestion was great. Don't try to eat this whole elephant, but find a couple specific pieces of it that you scratch your head and go, I don't know how we do this. You know, one of the things that, and I don't know why it stands out to me, but it stands out is they talk about physical barriers around every emergency incident scene for, you know, cold zone, warm zone, hot zone, and no entry zones. They're talking about using colored tape and barriers and those kind of things. And as I look at that, I go, I don't know how I would physically do that. I don't know how my department could pull that off. So I think those are the things. And if we did pull it off, this would be the additional annual cost to my organization per year compared to this as my total budget. So I think those are the details that we need to, all the passion that we got flying here in these comments, we need you to keep it, you know, each one of us needs to commit. I've got to make a comment. As of this morning, we just met with another group on this. I think there's 103 comments that have been published so far is, is all that have been put into the to federal OSHA site. Um, Out of those comments, there are a number of comments that are completely in favor of this. And I can tell you there's some organized labor groups that have come out and said, this is the greatest thing ever. We need to back this 100%. There's also a lot of private industry comments in there. And then there's some private citizen comments as well. So when you look at the percentage of the fire service that is even weighed in on this thing, it's very minute at this point in time. And that's not going to serve us well is, again, Don't think this thing is going away because I don't think in any way, shape or form it's going away. I just think there's some things in here that we need to try to get a better understanding of to get some help with how to implement that or to show why the specifics of what they're talking about. You know, my one example, putting physical colored barriers around each one of those zones and then, oh, every responder that shows up, I've got to tell them where those zones are and what those zones mean. As an incident commander, I don't have time to do that. And I don't know who on my staff I'm going to pull off another duty to do that in my organization. So those are the examples of how it would completely change how we deliver fire service in this country that we need to make sure that we're we're speaking to and we're getting that message across loud and clear. No, absolutely. And and I mean, Dave, that kind of so we as as an organization here at the National Volunteer Fire Council, as, as Joe had uh, kind of mentioned earlier, we're in the process of uh, of submitting our own comments. And what we're going to be doing here is uh, we are certainly going to be submitting a letter to OSHA requesting a 90 day extension, uh, just as also Bruce, I know uh, you, your uh, entity down at the SBA did this week as well. Um, and uh, because this is just it is it's a big elephant for all of us to digest. Um, And on that note of assisting you all, uh, 
in formulating your own comments and digesting this, we'll be sending around a list of those standards that are incorporated by reference. And now I know everyone's thinking, okay, NFPA, do I have to pay to view these standards? Um, I mean, they are they are available online. You can't print them, but you can view them for free online. So that's one way you can access them. But but again, focus on the things. I, I, I definitely go back to Dave's approach. Fo look through that meat and potatoes and focus on what is most burdensome to you if you have limited time. But that's just something we can do to assist you. We'll list all those standards that are incorporated by reference. Again, there's portions of them, not all of them. Um, and what we'll also do is we'll share with you some of the economic data that was quoted here. We'll point to some really key pages that you should pay specific attention to. Um, and we'll uh, we'll also share with you some other great rep, great links to great webinars. Dave did a great one. Uh, Keene University uh, did a great one in Massachusetts uh, to give you additional direction and reemphasize some of the points that we're raising here today. Uh, we'll also share with you the, the link to the, uh, to the standard text, uh, which also can contains directions on how to comment, where the comment page is, and uh, all that kind of key data. So I know we're throwing a lot out here. We're referencing a lot of things within this recording, and uh, we'll be we'll be following up with you um, within the next few days, uh, kind of just uh, with with additional resources that will assist you in, uh, in in kind of point you in the right direction there. What we'll also be doing is sharing a questionnaire with you all, and that will be really helpful to uh, to us here at the MVFC uh, to really formulate some data uh, as we are uh, drafting our own comments. Of course, this is something that will substantially impact the uh, volunteer fire service. And this is something that we will absolutely be engaging in submitting our own comments as a national organization. Uh, we've also been working and engaging with the Hill uh, you know, of course, right now it's an ongoing proceeding. We're in an open public comment period, but we have been uh, just encouraging, uh, you know, uh, members of Congress, uh, especially within key committees to just keep an eye on this, realize, you know, it may be coming and this is something we all may have to address. And, uh, you know, also we're, we're working in the process of seeing if they may have time for a hearing. That's a difficult ask right now since the calendar is getting a little bit more limited as we head into the fall election, um, just with available real estate, but we'll see what we can do there. But that raises another valuable point. As you request an extension, everybody here should, in addition to submitting comments, should, should just draft a quick letter requesting that 90 day extension. And when you do that too, request a public hearing. That will give us an additional opportunity to convey to OSHA, these are some of the challenges we're facing as a fire service. And this is where some of the data that you all are, are putting forth may be a little floor and we need to point this out to you. Um, so that's just kind of where we are. Uh, and also we'll have, uh, you know, we'll, we'll be going over just, uh, you know, basic gui other basic guidance too for you all. Um, but uh, with that, we'll uh, kind of take a look at some of the questions that we are receiving. Um, well, let me, I'm going to jump back. Sure, Joe, you, know, you know, I never want to yeah. shut up on this stuff. But look, as I'm listening and I'm thinking some things to tell them, look, you know, we have fire stations in Massachusetts that don't have running water. So if you have substandard facilities, you need to tell them this and say that this is a much higher priority for our community is building a fire station. Um, if you're parking trucks outside because you don't have space, they need to know that. Um, you know, tell them you don't have an office in your fire station or, or that, that you don't have any administrative staff, that you run this fire department from your kitchen table. They don't understand how many departments and how many communities rely on that. Um, another thing that, that came to me is uh, risk. If you've never had a death in your, uh, among a, a line of duty death in your department, tell them nobody's ever died here. We're good at keeping our people safe. I, there's there's some, some discussion in that long document about the fact that they think there's a whole bunch of unreported, unrecognized deaths and injuries in our in the fire service. I don't know where they get that from or, or where they're hearing this. I, I had one one injury last year uh, out of out of uh, 42 active firefighters. I'm going to put that in my response. We only had one injury out of 42 firefighters. Um, and they need to know that, that we're not, that there isn't this giant pile of, of, of injuries and, 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 and hurt firefighters they're rescuing. Um, if you're funded through fundraising, exclusively, primarily, in a big way, you need to tell them how many spaghetti dinners you need to sell 
to hire somebody to do 173 hours of compliance work for your department every year. I, it, it, it's, it's madness. And, and I just, I saw a comment and I agree, talk to your Congress people, um, talk to everybody. Uh, and, and lastly, I think I saw a comment about state to state differences. I, it's hard for us to, um, you know, say how this is gonna play out in each and every state. Uh, there's no doubt if you're if you're an OSHA plan state and you're a municipal or government fire department, you're in it. Um, I think that if you're a nonprofit, unaffiliated or an association or some kind of fire department in any state, you're a private entity. You're not protected by being part of the government in those states. You're in this. Um, this is going to be much broader, I think, than a. This isn't going to be narrow. It's going to be a broad reach across everybody to, at, to some degree, I think. I think you're absolutely right with that, Joe. And, you know, I was reading some of the comments going through, they go, can you give us some specifics or some highlights or some bullet points? Are we going to dive into that? I think the message that we want people to understand is it's substantial. You know, I, I just, I talked about the physical barrier part. There's a lot of stuff in the proposed standard about the physical fitness requirements of firefighters and what you're going to do with annual physicals. There's parts in the standard that talk about, you know, if you're exposed to a hazard, some additional medical uh, surveillance that we would be required to do on our firefighters. There's pieces in there that, you know, would dictate that we do, um, you know, some community action plans and we, we pre-plan, you know, any vacant buildings in our territory. Again, not terrible ideas. But when you look at the breadth of stuff that's in here, I wish we could say these are the 10 things that are going to change. There are hundreds of things, if not thousands of things that are going to change in the way that you probably do business in your organization. Um, you know, there's pieces in the proposed standard that talk about the use of fire poles and fire stations. And, you know, two years after it goes into effect that you would no longer be able to build a fire station with a fire pole in it. It talks about having sprinkled in a CO monitor in fire stations where you're going to have people sleeping in those in those quarters. Um, so there's, you know, again, I wish we could specifically say training is another huge area. So the, the proposed standard would require awareness level training of anything possible that you may go to. So think about all the different types of hazards that you may go to. You would now have to be able to document that we've at least given our folks awareness level training in these areas. It talks about the training requirements for interior firefighters and what they would need to have. There's a piece in there that talks about your officer levels and levels of training. And it's a belief of some people reading this that, you know, any of my captains and lieutenants would have to be qualified to that fire officer one level. Any assistant chiefs would have to be qualified to the fire officer two level. And any chief officers would need the fire officer three level. This is problematic in some states in that they don't even offer some of these courses or if they do offer them, they offer them in such limited capacity that in order to get everybody trained up to this, what would be the current standard at that point in time, would take hundreds of additional hours of classroom training. How is our tra state training agencies or private training agencies going to be able to put those things forward? So those are the things that, you know, we really need to, I know here in New York, and we started meeting on a weekly basis uh, right around Christmas. And we have a weekly call where we've got New York Office of Fire Prevention and Control. They're going through the standard saying, we believe it would now require this class, this class, and this class for these types of firefighters, this officer class and this officer class for that. And they're compiling that data to say what they currently have that would meet the standards and what we may not even have yet that isn't available. So how do we do that? One of the big questions that's come up is, you know, well, I took it when I took essentials of firemanship. My first firefighter class was 38 hours. That same class today is 100 and some hours. Um, you know, I've, I've seen some of the, the fire academies, Suffolk and Nassau counties and Long Island are saying we think it would take that 138 hours up to 200 and some hours just to meet that, get them to the front door requirement. Those are the kind of things that we've really got to peel back and understand and go, this is what that standard would mean. 
Yeah. I'm also and, thinking too the the emergency response plans, the standard operating procedures, post incident, pre incident, um, risk risk identification. There's a lot of reporting comment requirements as well, in addition to the training. And uh, there's also the fitness requirements. There's the um, there's the medical requirements. There's this question whether 15 exposures is a proper uh, number of exposures to mandate 1580 NFPA 1582 um, uh, physicals. So that's so there are that that's just a few other highlights too. And I'm sorry, Joe, I interrupted you. No, that's all right. I'm used to it. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you know it. it, it so I, I have a YMCA in my community because I'm thinking what I'm going to write to them. I have a YMCA in my community, and everybody who's a volunteer in my department has a membership of, at the YMCA. It's an arrangement we have with them. That's my health and wellness program. You think that's going to cut it? <laughs> I mean, th th these, th these standards are very specific as to what, what kinds of programs and what kinds of exams and what kinds of, 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 of things we're going to have to implement. And we're not going to have flexibility based upon the resources or the needs of our community. And I, I would also say something else I would attack is that th there's no data to support that, that a lot of these health and wellness programs actually do anything. They, we, you know, they're going to say we should do this. And, and it's one thing to have a best practice. We, you want to have a health and wellness program. We, we all should have one. Um, but you, you have to base it on, on, you know, how busy are you? What kind of calls do you do? You know, I'm primarily an, an, an EMS uh, agency. Uh, you, you might just be a fire agency. Um, you know, we all have different needs and it impacts our people differently, our size, our volume, the kind of things we go to is going to impact us all. But this is going to force us all into a one size fits all wellness program that that there's there's, there's no data out there that says I'm my people are going to be any healthier or better off than they are going over to the Y whenever they feel like taking a swim or working out. And, and that's, that's something we need to convey. There's a lot of assumptions here. The assumption they, they've gone after is that we're not trying to take care of our people. And the assumption is that they've given us all of these time and they're listening to all these discussion about cancer and suicide and wellness and that the fire service hasn't stepped up to deal with it. And I don't think that's true. I think many of us are stepping up to deal with this. I know the NVFC has been stepping up to deal with this. I know my own department, you know, we, we do a lot of things, but they don't fit neatly into these kind of these the, the standards that, that, that we have written for us. And now we're just going to be dictated, well, you do it this way and that's it. And if you vary from this, you're taking the risk that if something goes wrong, we're going to land on you with the full weight of the federal and state governments because you were outside the box or outside the lines in how you tried to do it. Um, you know, we, we do physicals here uh, in our department. We're better funded than, than maybe most other departments out there, but we can't do them annually. There's, there's no way we, we do them every couple of years. We, there's, you know, we can't always do all of these things. Um, we make resource decisions. And, and um, I, I don't know who they've been talking to. Joe, Joe, you bring up a great point. I think you hit the nail on the head with something. You, you kind of joked about it, saying our physical fitness plan is our local YMCA. My trouble with the way this thing is currently written is, for as detailed as it is, it's also very vague. So it, it doesn't really say whether allowing that membership is going to meet the standard or not. And by doing that, all that they really, I'm not worried, this whole thing, I'm not worried about the citations. I'm not worried about the fines from Pesh here in New York or OSHA or any of those kind of things. What I'm worried about is the liability that this opens up for our organizations when something goes wrong, when someone is injured, when someone is killed, we now have given a, an attorney you know, here's here's the questions you're going to ask when you're on your stand. Hey, did you meet this OSHA standard? Did you do this, 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 and this? And then a jury of our peers who know nothing about the fire service is going to decide, did we do that adequately or not? And I think we've left the door wide open and we're already watching, you know, what we call social inflation. When you look at what the average lawsuit settled for 10 years ago versus what it settles for today, it's mind-blowing and staggering. 
this standard to me, the way it's written, opens up the door for that number to just skyrocket even further. And then we've got bigger concerns of, you know, is that loss even insurable? If someone can show that we didn't follow the law, you may not be insured if your fire department didn't do the right thing. You know, punitive damages could come into this as well. Punitive damages aren't insurable. So who's going to pay these million dollar lawsuits when they occur, when somebody uses this as ammunition to come after an organization where, you know, something happened that probably shouldn't or couldn't, you know. Yeah. And just since we are uh, got 10 minutes left here, I do want to allow everybody just a little bit of time to give their final synopsis. But before we do that really quickly, one thing that was brought up in the questions that I think is really important to address is the fact that significant remuneration is brought up in the OSHA text, but what does that mean? And what is your assessment of that? And how should we convey to OSHA that we need more information to identify if we're going to be affected by this? In New York State, we have a couple um, cases. So we've had law where that's been challenged. Is a volunteer firefighter considered an employee or not? Um, you know, we have things like a, what's called VFBL. That's our basically our work comp for our firefighters. There's also uh, programs in New York State, which is a length of service awards program, where I give so many hours to my community on a regular basis. When I retire at age 65, you know, I get some basically a pension back out of, of those type of things. So in New York, because of a couple of those cases, it's very clear to us that we are going to fall under where even a volunteer firefighter is considered a, um, an employee under this law. I think in each and every state, that's going to be a little bit different, but you know, you bring up and I read in there, it really won't affect the volunteer fire service. Well, I know it does here in New York and a whole number of other states, but who's going to decide again, what substantial remuneration, you know, to me, are, to me, that would be $50,000 a year, but to, you know, someone else that may be, well, you got a thousand dollars worth of t-shirts and coats. We think you, you got paid for what you did. And what are, what are some other things you think departments should keep an eye out in this respect? And Bruce, I kind of see your, or I was just going to say a couple things because I, I was reading the uh, the questions coming through the chat. Um, and we did file a, a request for an extension of the comment period as well as a, a public hearing. And OSHA, under their statute, will have a public hearing after the comment period closes um, if anyone requests it. So I plan on that hearing, a post-comment hearing. Um, one of the things that we said in our letter to justify an extension of the comment period is that we're talking to small uh, uh, small business and uh, trade association groups like yours, and people don't know about this. And I think OSHA is surprised by that, that they've been working on this for you know many years and people don't know about it. So um, I recently attended the National Association of Counties um, meeting here in Washington, D.C., and I was handing out one page reg alerts on this and nobody had heard of this and i said take this back to your fire chief and your budget people and ask them to read this and find out you know can they can they do this um the other thing i wanted to mention um uh, just the comments here someone asked about whether states would have to adopt this in the state plan states the states would have to adopt a program that is at least as stringent as osha's and i think the person that asked this was from california so they, the states can go beyond what OSHA does, but it has to be at least as stringent as OSHA's. Another question was, was, uh, was uh, who can file comments? And anyone can file comments to this. So it doesn't have to be from an individual. It can be a, a, an individual, a group, a company, an association, uh, anybody. Um, also, someone was asking about why haven't the, the, they have obtained input from small entities about this. And there was an OSHA working group, I think it was in 2014, and your organization and your predecessor, in fact, Ryan, was um, very active in that group. Um, and it was the NACOSH, the National Advisory Committee on Occupational Safety and Health Working Group. And there was a huge focus of that group about not putting all the volunteer fire departments or the combo fire departments out of business in these small towns, counties, cities and everything. And there's a report of that that was issued. And we had the small business panel in 2021, and uh, both Dave and uh, Joe's colleague and Wes Barnstable participated on that. And they said much the same things. It was a big focus on that. So there, ha there has been this, and OSHA talks a lot about it. And they, they basically say, 
we have to focus on safety and we can't have these exceptions because it wouldn't meet our safety objectives. And that's why I keep coming back to this uh, technically and economically feasible and significant risk. So if there are risks that aren't significant, OSHA doesn't have jurisdiction. And then I just wanted to also mention, someone um, was talking about this bill. This is a regulation, not a statute. So, uh, Congress has delegated statutory to OSHA to uh, develop safety and health regulations. This is a regulation being uh, developed by OSHA and it's, it's not legislation. So thank you, Ryan, I'll turn it back with that. Yeah, no, thank you, Bruce. And actually one thing I'm just seeing too in the comments is timeline. There, there are timelines for a number of uh, the uh, requirements in this, uh, in, in the proposed rule. Um, and if you think that's short, that's something else you should convey in your in your comments. I mean, I, I know talking to Joe, Joe and I have had comments, I know Dave and I have had the same conversations where some of the stuff is gonna take you all decades, convey that. So that's just something else to uh, to weigh in there. And um, I know we have five minutes, and uh, and, and yeah. remind them of the of the date, the the for um, May sixth. Oh, May sixth. That's it. I couldn't remember. Thank you. Yes. May sixth is 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 unless we get an extension. So everybody plan on sending something in by May sixth. Yes. I, I've seen a number of requests there. Can you give us a can letter? Those kind of things. There's the FDSNY site that we've put in there. We've got some canned things. I think the personal ones are better. Hey, this from small town, my fire department, USA, this is my concern. You know, if I'm on a panel reading these type of things, that's going to mean a lot more to me than the 600th letter that I've seen on the same stationery with the same wording. So we really encourage folks to make comments. You know, if we could just get everybody on here to go in and make a comment, we need an extension, we need more time, and this is the impact that this would have on my organization. I think that's where we're gonna be able to make a difference. Describe your department, make it personal. We're, yeah. we're, we cover X number of uh, square miles and we have a small community of 3,800 people. We have a budget of, of $23,000 a year. We went to however many calls, there's 17 of us. Uh, we're all volunteers. Uh, we get we get 500 bucks a year to do this. Uh, we have no office. We have no administrative staff. We have no analysis people. Um, they, they, you, you, we need to pound this hard because they just don't grasp how different we are from what I will call the big suburban and urban fire service. Um, you know, my big suburban neighbors, they they they're front. They have more people in their front office than I have, you know, for staff to go to, to go to emergency calls sometimes. And, you know, in, in the urban world, they do There's there's, there's, there's chief officers that run analysis and data management departments. Um, you know, and, and they need to know that we aren't capable of that. For us just to read all of this could take us two years. So. Awesome. Absolutely. And uh, if there if there are no other uh, final thoughts, I'll just uh, reiterate that this is being recorded today. So if there's anything you feel you missed, you can go back and look through this. Um, in a few days, there will be uh, some additional resources again that will be sent around where we'll lay out everything that we're citing here, the 22 standards, the pages where those meat and potatoes are, the links to where you can comment um, and all that good stuff. So uh, with that, really appreciate all your interest today. Uh, it is very important that that you you know you file your uh, request for a 90 day extension again make it personal uh you know make those everyone file a comment make it personal i think that is so important if you exactly as joe said what joe just said outline describe your department and give all those details because uh it's important that osha receives as much of that information as possible so uh thank you all again and uh, thank you to our panelists thanks thank ryan thank you. enjoy go get them <laughs> <laughs>